huge relief uh, to uh, everybody involved. They've been waiting for this moment uh, really for years. This has been years in the planning, the years in the developing, and now that moment is finally here. So why don't we, uh, why don't we pipe down here and just listen to uh, launch control and uh, see how this goes. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Liftoff of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA. Go SpaceX. Godspeed, Bob and Doug. Vehicle pitching downrange. One Alpha. Copy. One Alpha. Stage one propulsion is nominal. Falcon power and telemetry nominal. M1D throttle down. We're throttling down to get ready for the period of maximum. Vehicle is supersonic. Well, looks like we are uh, on our way. The, the next big uh, moment is uh, Max Q. Garrett, why don't you explain to us what that is? So we've actually passed through the uh, period of the maximum aerodynamic pressure where the wind is the strongest. That's a challenging flight regime. Uh, and we're, we've passed that hurdle. And the next thing that will be coming up is the shutdown of the nine engines in the first stage. That will be very rapidly followed by separation of the stages and ignition of the MVAC vacuum engine, the second stage engine, to take us up into orbit. See, uh, uh, President uh, Trump are clapping there. It, it, it all seemed to, it looked picture perfect. Was it? Uh, as far, it, everything so far is nominal. Uh, it's really looking like a good flight, and uh, you know we got a ways to go here. So, uh, but uh, so far it was beautiful. It was just in, like dreamlike to see that thing actually take off. Yeah, it's it's exciting to, to watch it, no matter how many times you've seen it before, and nobody has probably seen it more than Bill. So, but what were your thoughts? Is it is it finally uh, lifted off the pad, and we're actually in this new space era? Well, we've seen a lot of Falcon 9s take off, and from that perspective, the launch looked exactly like all the others we've yeah, seen. The difference this time is you know there are two human beings on board, and that gives it a whole different sense of urgency, no question about it. Uh, I want to say we're looking at a camera now that's on the rocket itself looking back at the Earth. Uh, so, you're getting ready to see stage separation where the first stage will shut down its engines, fall away, and then the flight will continue on the power of the second stage engine. Joe. Falcon stage separation confirmed. The view you have on the on Falcon the left side of your screen is looking up at the second stage from the first stage, and the view on the right side is actually the view of the second stage engine, which is now lighting up. Uh, it'll glow red hot. That's how it actually cools itself down. And that first stage uh, will turn around and come on back and, and will attempt to land it on a ship. I mean, we've heard a lot of talk about how this this is fully automated. So what is it that the astronauts at this point are responsible for? Are, are they are they just along for the ride, or is there something more to it? At, at this point, they are uh, monitoring the performance. They're looking at their screens to see if they are heading in the right direction at the right speed. Uh, there's really only one command that they can they can use at this uh, during ascent, and that is there's a big handle right there uh, you see in the left screen in the middle of the two of them. That if you pull that, it will light up the Super Draco escape system. And you hear them in the background talking about different two A, two B. These are different things that the Super Dracos will do if you pull that handle right now, or if it automatically goes right now. And Mark, uh, just to jump in real quick, these views we're seeing from inside the cockpit, we've never seen live video of U.S. astronauts uh, in a rocket during launch on a U.S. spaceship. The Russians have done this for, for years, but uh, we've never seen this view uh, for an American launch. And when he, when Garrett mentioned the escape system, let, let's talk about that a little bit because that also factored into the weather that we were talking about. It wasn't just weather uh, here on the launch pad, but weather all the way up the East Coast in the Atlantic, really all the way to Ireland, they just as a contingency plan. Why, but why don't you explain to folks how exactly that's going to work and making sure that the astronauts always have a way out if something really should go wrong. 
Yeah, so the, the uh, spacecraft has Super Draco engines. There are eight of them in pairs of two in these, in these four pods. And if, uh, if the Falcon 9 is having a bad day, they can light up. Now, early on, they would take the trunk with them if that would happen, uh, and the trunk fins would provide stability in the atmosphere. Now, at this point, they would just leave without the trunk, and they can get away from the Falcon 9 very quickly, uh, and in fact, have that luxury of that system all the way up to orbit, which is something we didn't have during shuttle. And depending when it, heaven forbid that it, it, it needed to happen, but depending when it happened, they would land somewhere in the Atlantic and it, it could go, what, all, all the way to Ireland, right? That's correct. So actually we avoid the North Atlantic on purpose. Uh, at first we will turn back and head to ha uh, Nova Scotia, basically Halifax, and then once we get a little further along, we actually will speed up with the Super Draco engines and head to Shannon, Ireland. So we will not uh, come down to that, that nasty North Atlantic. And Bill, I, I have to imagine that everybody at this point is just thrilled with how this has all gone so far. Absolutely, but you know, talking about that crew escape system, the Air Force is still standing by. They have uh, crews stationed in Joint Base Charleston, South Carolina, at nearby Patrick Air Force Base, although they're now beyond the realm where Patrick would come to their aid. Uh, but if there was something unexpected that happened that did make them ditch into the ocean, as Garrett said, avoiding the North Atlantic, uh, the rescue crews on base at uh, Charleston would immediately take off and search these guys down and help them out. But so far, an absolutely picture-perfect launch. Garrett, did you hear anything at all that struck you as, because it's easy to watch and assume everything is going well, but sometimes if you listen with a trained ear to what, to what the launch controller is saying, you, you pick up little subtle cues that something is, they're worried about something or thinking about something. Was there any sign of anything? Uh, yeah, no, so far everything seems uh, absolutely perfect. Uh, everything is nominal. Uh, I haven't heard anything that uh, is, is any kind of surprise, which is exactly what you want uh, in these situations. Now we're coming up uh, only about two minutes away from the cutoff of the second stage engine, or SECO, and that would be Bob and Doug getting up into space and, and being uh, uh, pretty much all the way there. Uh, and uh, at the same time, you see on your right of your screen there, that's the first stage uh, of the rocket coming back and heading to land. And they'll, that'll happen in pretty quick succession, the, the landing of the first stage and the cutoff of the engine and Bob and Doug inserted into the correct orbit with the second stage. And Bill, is there any way to, to underestimate the value of this first stage coming back to Earth, landing and being reusable as, as it's revolutionized rocketry and revolutionized the business model of space? Well, it really has. And it, it's not just SpaceX. They're the ones who pioneered this, but their example has is, is inspired other rocket builders, uh, their competitors, both in the U.S. and in Europe and in Russia, uh, to begin designing their own reusable spacecraft just to be able to compete. Uh, and I'd like to just point out on the right side of the screen right now, you're seeing uh, three of the engines on the, on the first stage firing to slow it back down to plunge back into the thick lower atmosphere uh, so they can line up on the drone ship, whimsically named, of course, I Still Love You, uh, <laughs> to come in for a landing. But this is something that has uh, really revolutionized uh, the whole space launch industry, no question about it. Garrett, you work for Elon Musk for seven years. What do you think is uh, going through his, his mind and his heart right now? Um, you know, I bet, uh, I bet he's feeling kind of like I am. I'm, I think I'm doing a good job of not showing it, but we're kind of both nervous wrecks. Uh, and uh, I bet he's probably, probably feeling something pretty similar. Because when I talked to him earlier this week, and I, we heard from him too, I mean, there's a huge difference in, in the level of responsibility between flying cargo and flying people, right? He's got. Two lives are on the line, and, and it's his rocket that's responsible for, and capsule responsible for taking them up and bringing them back. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a huge step up in uh, responsibility and uh, seriousness and, and consequences of failure. Uh, so uh, we're, we're approaching right now the end of the, the second stage burn. And you hear copy, Shannon. That means that uh, they've entered some of the last of those abort modes, but everything is nominal. And uh, hopefully very soon we're going to shut that engine down and uh, the ascent phase, uh, one of the biggest hurdles of getting into space, will be complete. What do the astronauts feel when that happens? They're feeling right now about four and a half Gs. I think I heard MVAC shut down, so it sounds like we do have a good successful insertion into orbit. They're feeling four and a half Gs. It feels like they weigh about four and a half times as much as they do. And right there at MVAC shutdown, they immediately feel zero Gs and they feel weightless.